even on days like today. And all you watching at home online and the comfortability, thank you. We appreciate the two-way video cameras that we have. Uh, your slippers don't match. Yes, I hope Santa's bringing you some for Christmas. We're glad you're joining us no matter where that you are. The first Christmas may not have had weather harsh like what we have right now, but they definitely had a harsh culture and a harsh situation that first Christmas. If we will remove the romantic softness that we tend to put on the Christmas, first Christmas with everything being so beautiful and so perfect. I mean, come on, seriously, away in a manger, the little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes, seriously? No crying? You're holding baby, baby ever, yeah. Oh, but he's so perfect, Jesus was perfect. Perfect doesn't mean he didn't cry, perfect means he didn't sin. Big difference, big difference. The, uh, but what Joseph and Mary were going through, public scorn, humiliation, it was a dark, cruel time. There's, a, there's an absolute slaughter of children under the age of two by a paranoid king, King Herod, because he heard there was a king being born, and so he killed every child under the age of two in Bethlehem. Nazareth, Beth, Bethlehem, Bethlehem. The government forces difficult travel. Mary's probably pretty pregnant, doesn't feel like traveling. How could they rise above this? Hope. Hope. The hope of Christmas. Not romanticized, uh, photoshopped, put in a sale circular hope. But hope, do you have hope? Do you remember what hope feels like? Do you remember what hope smells like? Because right now, maybe you're in a spot where you really need some hope. Maybe the reason you're watching online is because you want some other voice in the house and you're tired of being in the house all by yourself. And you're not looking forward to that on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. We need hope. We need hope. Joseph and Mary were in serious need of hope, and we are as well. And the holidays are exponential. If things are going good, boom, holidays multiply it by 10. Come on, if you had a good, good childhood and, and seven, age seven, Christmas, you're going, wow, that was awesome. You look back on the pictures, and you're going, man, that tree was only eight feet tall. I really thought that tree was at least 10 stories. Oh, my goodness. But if your holidays are exponential, they're exponential both ways. They'll multiply whatever you're going through. Isolation, family problems, all the commercialism. Too much responsibility. It multiplies the atmosphere, the cooking, the parties, the pressures, the gifts, the finances. Maybe the holidays right now are a reminder of personal loss to you because there's an empty chair. Maybe the empty chair was something bad. A family breakup or a funeral you attended this year. Maybe the empty chair is something good. A kid that finally left the house. Woohoo! But now you're missing him and you wish he was back, at least just for a couple days. Just for a couple days. Not permanently. Not permanently. The, uh, so let's talk about hope. What do we mean by hope? Some people, they say hope, but what they're really talking is wishful thinking. They're hoping this happens. They're trying to hope things into existence and hope things out of existence. And sometimes it convinces us of things that aren't even true. Some of you are just hoping that your, your family will come back together. You're hoping for this. You're hoping for things that you don't really have any control over. Some say hope, but they're not meaning wishful thinking. They're really meaning blind optimism. They're seeing everything through glasses that are perfectly rose-colored and everything is awesome. They were cast for the Lego movie and they had a starring role in the Lego movie because everything was awesome and they treat their problems as if they don't exist. Oh, I just hope that bill's going to get paid somehow. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, no, that car doesn't have a battery. I just hope it starts somehow. Blind optimism. That's not what we're talking about when we say you can have hope and the kind of hope that you need today. Some say hope, but what they really mean is ambitious dreams and, my goodness, dream big but we have restrictions by our limitations or our circumstances. If you're 65 and you speak one language, you will never become a multilingual international business expert. It's probably not going to happen at age 65. We have some limitations. Shoot baskets all day. But if you only have one arm or you're missing, missing something, you're probably never going to make it to the National Basketball Association. Hoping is something that most people are doing, but the Bible says something is hope that we can have. We can have it. Like memories. You have memories. People can't take those memories no matter what the situation or the circumstance. You have that. You can have hope. Do you remember what hope feels like? Do you remember what it smells like? Do you remember how you feel when you're walking in hope even though your, your circumstances still haven't totally changed? I'm going to talk about the hope of Christmas. Not the hope of the way we treat it in our culture make everything perfect. Did you notice on that video how crazy it was that Joseph and Mary actually looked like Palestinian Jews? Isn't that wild? Why couldn't they cast them to look like Americans? I mean, seriously. Because it was harsh. It was rough. And they needed hope. Maybe you do too. If you have your bulletins with you, go ahead and pull them out. If not, I hope that we have some ushers available to go ahead and hand some bulletins out to those that might need them. Apparently we have usher, singular, singular. 
Travis, thank you very much, man. Thank you very much. Mike, Travis will help you out there, friend. The uh, first thing in our bulletins is this this morning. Hope encourages me when I'm disappointed. It encourages me when I'm disappointed. The, during the first Christmas, as they were approaching it, Joseph and Mary were definitely facing some serious disappointment. You might not think so, but think it through. Joseph, huh, my fiance is pregnant and it's not me. Hmm, this is a difficulty. Uh, you know what? I think we'll just call this off. We're just going to call this wedding off. Yeah, that's what, that's what we'll do. And that's what he was thinking. He was going to, in their minds, divorce because it, the betrothal process was, was an engagement process where basically it's a legal commitment. And Mary's going, yeah, I'm not married yet and I'm pregnant. And I'm telling everyone it was God. Yeah, this isn't working out the way I had thought. That's not what I had planned for my 16th birthday. Disappointment. Disappointment robs us of courage. It brings the opportunity for fear to step in. Fear, something God has never felt. You know all those other emotions that you felt? You know, anger, love, passion, hate, disgust, excitement. God's felt all those. Fear? Nope, he hasn't. You have. I have. He's never, he's never smelled fear. So Joseph's considering dumping Mary because it's going to be difficult and it's not the right thing. He's trying to do what's right. And After he had considered this, he being Joseph, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. No matter how disappointing your circumstances are, do not be afraid. Older translations of the Bible would say, fear not, fear not. Do not be afraid. To do what? To go through with what your plan was don't be disappointed. Don't walk in fear because your plan is now a little bit more difficult. Don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So what disappointment did 2016 bring your way? I mean, is there any of us that have lived this entire year that have had no disappointment at all? Surely we've all had some hiccups. We've had some speed bumps. And some of us didn't have speed bumps. Some of us had uh, Mount Rushmore pop up into our life. Mountains that we did, didn't, didn't come out of a molehill. They're just mountains. They happen. And then they give way to fear. And that fear doesn't have to be there. What disappointed you in 2016? Family, people, work, the economy, the election, personal health, your career outlook? Jesus said this. I've told you these things, talking about what he teaches, so that in me you may have peace. Sounds like the opposite of fear. You may have have peace in me if we're in him we can have peace and then jesus continued in this world you will have trouble you will have trouble wait a second you just said we can have peace yeah you will have trouble you're going to have trouble in this world but you said we can have peace you can have peace you can have peace and trouble at the same time oh but i'm following jesus so i won't have any trouble that's eh, not wrong jesus <laughs> wrong jesus look back to your bible Jesus said, take heart, be of good courage. I've overcome the world. I've overcome it. The trouble that you have, yeah, you're going to have that trouble. But in me, you can have peace. What would that peace do? Kick fear to the curb. You don't have to walk in that fear. You don't have to walk in that disappointment. He encourages us. And Christmas, not the Photoshop Target ad that comes in. Christmas, Christ coming the incarnation, the reality of the God's love showing up in human fleshly form gives us encouragement. So how will you draw closer for that encouragement? Maybe that's, that's what you did today because you were thinking about not coming and understandably so. No guilt trip for those who didn't. Not going to play that game. But that encouragement, how will you draw closer? And if you don't draw closer to encouragement, what's going to happen? Well, we just continue to go down the road of disappointment. We don't have to go down that road. He's paved the road for us to be encouraged and move forward with that. Number two, what else does Christmas bring? It strengthens me when I'm distressed. Christmas strengthens me when I'm distressed. Even if it's not Black Friday, it strengthens me when I'm distressed. First Christmas, lots of distress going around. Mary is probably weak, fragile, ready to give birth, probably lonely and scared. And where is she going? A town she's never been before. Why? Because some stupid king said, hey, because of taxes... Yep, here comes your government. Taxes are involved. And now I have to go visit all my future husband's relatives because he has to go to his, the land of his ancestry. And now she's surrounded by nobody she knows. 
Would that stress you out, ladies? First baby's coming on the way, and now you're going to meet all your husband's family, and they're going, huh, I'm doing the math here, and I'm not so sure you did what you're supposed to be doing. Joseph, a little bit unable to provide like he'd like to. Now, however you want to read into, uh, there was no room for them at the end if that meant they went to the comfort suites and they were, they were out of space, and so they had to stay in, in a back building on Pitt State campus, or if you want to read into that and realize that what it meant was there was no room where they'd like to be, so they had to be somewhere else, but they're still in a house you know what? He still can't give what, his wife what he wants. And men don't like that. They don't like not being able to do what they're expected they should be able to do. And here's the thing, though. They're not being disobedient. They're not disobeying God. They're not running from God. They're not living in sin. They're, they're receiving what God gave them, and it's not working out like they hoped. You ever been there? Maybe you're living there. You've done what, quote-unquote, you're supposed to do, and because of faulty theology, we go, well, I did what I was supposed to do, therefore it should be easy. No, 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 no. If I did what I was supposed to do, therefore I'm pleasing God. I'm pleasing God, and I have a smile. But his smile doesn't mean all my circumstances give me comfort and convenience. Joseph and Mary could be going, no one knows, no one cares, no one understands. Did we hear God right? Is he happy with us? Did we do something wrong? No one even believes our story. And it's pretty hard not to understand why they don't believe our story. It makes sense why they don't. And they don't have anyone to corroborate their story until God sends someone into their life to strengthen them. We know them as the shepherds who were keeping watch over their flocks at night. And the shepherds are out there, and all of a sudden there's angels that come out there and say, Hey, you shepherd guys, there's cool things that are happening over there. Of course, they're singing, angelic choir, all that kind of stuff. There's cool things happening in Bethlehem. You'll find a child swa wrapped in swaddling clothes. Some of you remember the lines that you had to say as a kid in a Christmas program while you were stuttering and your mom was taking pictures of you and all that kind of stuff. The angels finally left the shepherds. And we pick it up in chapter 2, verse 15. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, and can you just see the six-year-old boy standing there saying this? Let us go to Bethlehem and see this, this thing that has happened. And the other one walks up, which the Lord has told us about. And the mom's going, oh, he did it. He did it. He didn't mess it up. He didn't embarrass me. The dad's going, that's my boy. That's my boy. So they hurried off. And they found a husband and a wife with a new baby that are pretty stressed out. They're pretty confident that it's still a God thing. But just because it's a God thing doesn't mean it's easy the whole time. So they found Joseph, Mary and Joseph and the baby. Always good to find the baby with Mary and Joseph, who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, referring to Jesus, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. Hey, did you hear about this child? Hey, did you hear about this? All who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up. She treasured up. What do you need to treasure up? Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. What do you need to treasure up? I love the word up there. Because we tend to think what's happening in our life is being pushed down. Even if it's something God wants us to do, but it's hard, it's difficult, we're in a season that's difficult. Treasure it up. Who is God sending to you to strengthen you? Who has God sent to you to strengthen you? Because you know what happens when they come? Shepherds are like the lowest of low lives. Shepherds are out in their field. Don't think romantic. Oh, it's so beautiful out there. Think as if you were a shepherd last night, okay? <laughs> some of you live on farms, you're going, yeah, it, it, ain't, it ain't all wonderful, man. Sometimes there's some smells that aren't all that good either. And you step in something, you're like going, ah! That's why the boots stay outside. Mm -hmm. the boots don't come in the house. Shepherds weren't high on the totem pole for socioeconomic status. But God didn't send the shepherds to Joseph and Mary to solve any problems but to strengthen you might be sitting there waiting man I wish God would send someone and solve this and fix this and make my problems go away maybe instead he's sending something or someone to strengthen you and because they're just shepherds did you possibly discount what they had to say because of who they were we gotta be careful with that we don't want to do that who is God sending to you? Or who is God sending you to? And you're already convinced, oh, they're not going to respect what I have to say. 
Uh, Mary and Joseph weren't going to respect what shepherds had to say. But you know what? No matter where you are in life, no matter how high you're up on the ladder, if you go to a spot where you feel low enough, you'll listen to anybody. Why do you think people have cats and dogs? Because they'll talk to their cats and dogs, right? <laughs> they'll talk to the wall. If they'll talk to the wall, they'll listen to you. They'll listen to you. What else does the hope of Christmas bring us? It guides me when I'm doubtful. It guides me when I've got doubts. Joseph and Mary, they're probably doing all right. Hey, baby, Jesus is here. Woo, Jesus, we love Jesus. We do love Jesus. That's awesome. Now what? Let's check that shepherd thing. That was cool. I appreciated that shepherd encouragement, but uh, man, they're gone. And they didn't leave any gifts or anything. We don't know that two years down the road, more gifts are going to come. And we're kind of new to this parenting thing. The whole sleeping through the night thing, we're still trying to get there on that. Uh, so what do we do now? So what did they do? They did what was normal. They did what was ordinary, even though their child wasn't. And they did what was absolutely expected by their culture from the political side as well as the religious side and the family side. They took Jesus baby Jesus to the temple to be dedicated verse 25 Luke 2 there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout he was waiting for the constellation of Israel the Messiah to show up and the Holy Spirit was upon him it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ moved by the Spirit he went into the temple courts when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, some dedication stuff and probably some circumcision stuff, Simeon took him in his arms. Would that freak you out, ladies, if a guy you've never met before, when you're getting ready to go through a religious ceremony, came up and snapped your kid from your hands? Yeah! Can you, can you picture uh, Mary going, Joseph, Joseph, I don't know this guy. What's he doing? What's he doing? Joseph, this guy's, this guy's going to that crazy church down the road. Get the baby back, Joseph! Get him back now! Simeon praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, I can die now. You can dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles. That's kind of crazy because Jews and Gentiles, they like didn't, didn't hang out. And for glory to your people Israel. This time the child's father and mother marveled. Not just the mother, the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. What do you need to marvel at? Instead of staring at the clouds of doubt that are legitimately there, what do you need to marvel at? Who has God sent and spoken that maybe you've never met before? Maybe they go to the crazy church down the road. Maybe they're of a socioeconomic status that is way, way above you or way, way below you. And, you, and you, that morning, maybe you say, oh God, I just need a sign. Just give me a sign. And he sent someone. And they said something that you thought was just innocuous, unnecessary, not connected. And you discarded them because they're not part of your inner circle. Yet it was God sending something or someone into your heart and into your life to speak something that you needed to hear to encourage you, to strengthen you for you to marvel at when every parent you know all your kids faults but why do we discount it so quickly when another adult comes and tells us how awesome our kids are if we're not careful we'll go yeah but you ought to see them when they get home why not consider what they're trying to tell you to encourage you and to strengthen you they have a different perspective because if you're not careful you start believing and no wonder we fall into clouds of doubt because then we, we only start thinking about our own thoughts and we don't listen to anyone who has an outside perspective because when we look at ourselves and our situation, we are easy to deceive ourselves. The easiest person in the world to deceive is ourself. The easiest person in the world to lie to is ourself. And when someone else walks up to you and says, you look nice, why is our first response to think they have no idea what they're talking about? When they walk up and you say, hey, your kid was doing amazing stuff. Oh, yeah, but... Everyone acts out of character sometime. <laughs> At some point, God is simply just going to go ahead and go, face palm. <laughs> he's doing everything he can. Next thing he's going to do, he's going to send a donkey to talk to us. What do we need to marvel at? What do we need to marvel at? Jesus said this. He spoke to the people, and he said, I am the light of the world. 
Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus did not say, whoever follows me will never see darkness. There'll be darkness around you, absolutely. Absolutely. You can go in the darkest place on the planet. You can go to the darkest place in your attic if you want to, but if you have light, you stay in the light. You don't walk in the darkness. But if you turn off the light, you're going to be in the darkness. Keep the light on. Keep the light on. Keep people around you that have that light on. How is God trying to guide you in the midst of doubts? And is it possible? Because right now you're looking at your schedule and you're going to do the same thing you do on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day and, and then you're going to go back to work and everything's just normal, normal, normal. Why is it that we always think and expect, oh God, I need to do something super amazing, magnificent that's never been done before? When maybe he just wants to operate in the normal, you're going to show up and park in your regular spot at work and someone's going to say something. And if your heart's open, you're going to realize God used the Holy Spirit. God used that person. The Holy Spirit used that person to say what you needed to hear, even though they're not on your approved list of God-usable people in your life. It'll be in the normal, just as if Joseph and Mary were going to the temple to do what's absolutely normal and expected, nothing out of the ordinary. God excels in speaking in the ordinary. I don't know who did the count. I don't know if it's accurate, but I love the, the idea behind it. Someone apparently counted up and said, you know, the idea of fear not or do not be afraid is in the Bible about 365 times. I'm sure if you tweak it, and depending on what translation you want to use, you can probably come up with that number. But the, the idea is amazing and powerful. Daily, we need to re be reminded we don't need to walk in fear. And we're not called to walk in fear. We're also not called to bury our head against the facts. But just because the facts aren't what we want them to be does not mean we need to walk in fear. I'm looking across this room, and some of you have been through hell and back in 2016. And there may have been moments that fear was creeping up like crazy on you, whether it was financial fear, uh, fear over your kids, whatever it might be. But you didn't stay walking in that fear. And you didn't give in to that fear. You stayed in the light, and you keep walking in the light, and we walk out of fear. Joseph was told, because he was in a situation that called for fear, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Mary was in a situation all around Christmas time. Not the perfect Disney Christmas, but the real Christmas. You don't have to stay in the dark. You don't have to. You know, a couple of Christmas songs that pop in the head. The Thrill of Hope, A Weary World, somebody? Rejoices. How can a weary world rejoice? That's an oxymoron, right? No, it's a sacrifice. It's a commitment. A weary, a weary you can still rejoice. It drives the dark of doubt away. It's not saying that, that having doubts means you're in sin. It's saying we can drive that dark away. So the last truth I'd like to leave you is this. Don't try and drive out darkness, though. You'll get fatigued way too fast, and you won't be able to have the power to do it. Just turn on the light. Just draw near to the light. Stay focused on Him. When things are good and when things are rough, he said, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Zeke, can you bring your team up, friend? Thank you, sir. And we're going to take a little bit of a twist here this morning. And in just a moment, I'm going to open up the altars this morning just to come down to the front. But I want to be real specific about what we're praying for. And sometimes, you know, hey, if you're dealing with this sin or something, come down to the altar. Not, if you're in a spot this morning where you're going, Pastor, I need some more hope. I need some more hope. For me, just showing up today was a big way of me turning on the light and trying to drive out darkness. But I would just love to receive prayer for more hope. I'm not, I'm not asking for uh, prayer so that I can do better with wishful thinking or blind optimism or just my ambitious dreams. I need hope. I'm looking toward Christ right now. That's where I'm aimed, Pastor, but I need some more hope. So in just a moment, we'll stand. Zeke's going to lead us out. And actually, the first song that he's got ties in wonderfully with this. And that wasn't even planned about doing an altar invitation. I thought about that this morning when we were praying. But hope. Pastor, I just want to be prayed for. I'm going to, open, I'm going to open my hands and my heart to God, and I need some more hope poured into my heart, my mind, and my soul. And if that's you, when we start, I'm just going to ask you to just come down to the front. Stand if you would instead of kneel. It's easier to pray for you if you're standing. But if you want to stand, kneel, or jump up and down, that's up to you. But do you have hope today? Do you want some more hope? 
Stand with me, would you? As you're standing, what would you tell someone who feels like they're walking in darkness? Would you tell them, trust your own thoughts? Do what feels right in your heart? Or would you tell them, look toward the light? Turn on the light and trust his word. Let's bow our heads and our hearts across this place. Father, you're amazing. And I thank you for the rawness of the first Christmas and the realness. Because right now, some of us in this room feel really raw and really real. And we need hope. Then we're not going to get it at Target or Amazon. And so we're willing to humble ourselves and look towards you for hope.